Good morning, and welcome back to Voices of the Church, a journey with the fathers and doctors. Welcome to those of you who are here. Welcome to those of you who are joining us virtually or who will be joining us later uh, by video. Today we move into the second part of our series, which is to begin looking at the four great Latin doctors of the church, uh, St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, St. Augustine, and Pope St. Gregory the Great in that chronological order. Each one of these men are distinguished by the influence that they have on the faith through their actions, through their writings. Um, each one of them is an inspiration to us today for a very different reason. Each one is a defender of the faith, each in his own way. And the first of this group is, of course, St. Ambrose of Milan, whose life and writing we're going to explore a little bit today. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about what you're looking at on this, on this PowerPoint slide is a 4th century mosaic, or part of it, actually. You're only seeing part of it. It is a full body-length mosaic. It is, by tradition, purported to be a contemporary likeness of St. Ambrose. Uh, it is found in the church that bears his name in Milan, and the oldest part of the structure where these mosaics are found uh, date to uh, to the end of his lifetime. So it is believed by many art historians that this is a contemporary likeness of him. So, first things first today, the quiz on your reading. Okay, no, not really. <laughs> How many of you already have, already have read um, on the mysteries? Okay. Uh, there is something that may help frame our understanding of him a little bit. And so I want to begin with that today. I want to begin by telling uh, a story. Uh, essentially, it is a story, but it is a, a story of a pretty horrific event that happened in the spring of the year 390 in the ancient city of Thessalonica uh, in Greece. Um, there was, of course, this was, of course, part of the Roman Empire, obviously, under imperial control. And... Um, Attached to the Roman garrison there was a general, Roman general, by the name of Butheric. And Butheric's job was, of course, in being in charge of the garrison. His, his, his duty was, was not only military, but also he had some, uh, some temporal, secular authority there as well. He was responsible for keeping the peace, for maintaining the order. And, uh, and, and he, uh, apparently, what happened is he arrested a very popular public figure. The man whose name is lost to us was apparently a very popular chariot racer. And uh, when he arrested him, the local people there revolted. They rioted uh, against this. I think, if anything, it's probably um, a, kind of a commentary on how, how timeless our obsession is with popular culture sometimes, that they all followed this man and, and thought he was quite the hero. Anyway, some of the people there uh, Thessalonica rioted, and this angry mob actually captured and murdered this Roman general, Butheric. So, the emperor, the Roman emperor in the east, uh, was Theodosius I. And when Theodosius I heard this news, uh, he was furious. And so one evening, shortly after, uh, after this event, when citizens of the, of, the, of the city had gathered in the Hippodrome, the circus there, where these chariot races actually took place, as, as well as other spectacle kind of entertainments. Theodosius ordered imperial troops to surround the area and they carried out the massacre of approximately 7,000 men, women, and children within just a few hours in retaliation for the murder of Butheric. At least one ancient historian records it this way. I'm going to quote uh, Theodoric. Quote, the anger of the emperor rose to the highest pitch, and he gratified his vindictive desire for vengeance by unsheathing the sword most unjustly and tyrannically against all, slaying the innocent and the guilty alike. It is said that 7,000 perished without any form of law and without even having judicial sentence passed upon them, but that like ears of wheat in the time of harvest, they were alike cut down. Now, it did not take long uh, for, the, for the news of this, this massacre of Thessalonica, to, to, as history has now reported it, 
to reach the ears of the man who was the Bishop of Milan. In case you were wondering what this story had to do with St. Ambrose. Uh, it did not take long for the news of this to reach the Bishop of Milan. Milan actually being the site of the imperial court uh, in the 4th century, by the way, where Emperor Theodosius was in residence. He was in residence in Milan when this happened. So there followed quite a showdown between bishop and emperor, between church and state. This has been dramatized by some. The bishop, uh, Ambrose, publicly rebuked, publicly rebuked the emperor and excommunicated him for the savagery of this, of this response. Now, it is probably fiction, I mean, it makes a great story, but it probably is fiction that there was a literal encounter at the door of the church in Milan where Ambrose refused to permit him entry. That has been depicted in art across the centuries very dramatically of, of, of St. Ambrose standing there in full vestments, right, with his crozier in his hand, and he is barring uh, the, the emperor from entering uh, the church. That's, that's an artistic representation that's probably fictional. But even though such a scene is, is probably fictional, we do know from surviving correspondence, surviving correspondence, that Ambrose refused him the sacraments until he had done penance. And this took some eight months before the showdown was over, and the emperor did just that. By Christmas of 390, Emperor Theodosius was restored to full communion with the church. And keep in mind, one of the reasons I think this is, is, is so important, keep in mind that, that this is no mere Roman emperor who may have been at one point in his life pagan or entertained pagan ideas. This was Theodosius I, who 10 years before, in the year 380, who had issued the edict that made Christianity the official religion of the empire. Okay, you may remember that it was Constantine the Great who extended, by the Edict of Milan, extended toleration to Christians in the Roman Empire. Uh, in, in, uh, in 313, but it was the Emperor Theodosius I who actually made Christianity uh, the official state religion, if you will. So the story of Ambrose uh, boldly standing up to a Roman emperor and holding him accountable publicly for his actions is historical. Although, at this point in this series, it's probably not going to surprise anybody to hear this, that some scholars today question, question the historicity or the authenticity of the story. That probably won't surprise us uh, to hear that today. But St. Augustine related the story as well, uh, that the emperor, uh, as St. Augustine tells us, the emperor eventually responded with humility, and that St. Ambrose actually spoke uh, very movingly at the emperor's funeral about his sincere contrition. It's ultimately a tale of two men and two positions, one temporal, one spiritual, uh, with the spiritual calling the temporal to its eternal purpose. That's sort of the big takeaway from that story. There is no doubt that that is the way that St. Ambrose saw those events, or how he remembered them, or would have recorded them. Now, we don't have any record of his afterwards. But we do have his letters surrounding the event, and we have uh, St. Augustine, of course, his disciple. St. Augustine, uh, who testified to those events. So St. Ambrose of Milan is a really interesting combination of attributes, a truly complex personality, which, of course, always makes them more fascinating to the historian, uh, or, to, or to anyone, really, who loves a good story. In fact, I think the same can be said for many of the figures in this series that we're going to be looking at in the coming weeks, uh, particularly these, these Latin and Greek doctors we'll, we'll be looking at in the next few weeks. They are all multidimensional people, multidimensional figures, with complexities to them, and some more than others, obviously, but, but with complexities to their personalities that, that just draw us to them naturally, even if they weren't people we were studying in a faith formation series. For this bishop to be so bold uh, in the year 390, it might surprise uh, someone who knows little about him to learn that this is the same man, St. Ambrose, who was the most reluctant bishop. As a matter of fact, he didn't want to be bishop. He ran away from it. Literally ran away from it. 
at first. Born in the year 339 to 340, uh, different sources report uh, different years, but he did, he did not come to profess Christianity until his mid-30s. Uh, he was in fact, uh, it was in fact the year 374, he was 35 years old, uh, by my account, 34, 35. Uh, when he was named bishop, by unanimous acclamation of the people of Milan, uh, he, he was in, he was in a, a governorship position uh, in Milan uh, before he became a Christian. And uh, he came into the church in Milan one day to speak out against the Arian heresy. And this was while he was still a catechumen. Are you hearing this? He hadn't even been baptized yet. And he came in to speak out against Arianism. And the people of Milan started shouting, Episcopi, 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 like he was going to be a bishop. Um, well, he not only, as I said, was not only reluctant, but ran away from the whole idea, but of course had to be baptized first, had to be ordained a priest before he could be ordained a bishop. Um, but in a most unusual sequence of events that is not common in church history, I might add, this is not the ordinary way of things, in a most unusual sequence of events, uh, even in early church history. So once he became a bishop, though, he does seem to have embraced uh, not only the, the, full, uh, the fullness of that office and what it represented as being a successor to the apostles and, and the responsibility for that teaching, but he also embraced a very rigid, aesthetic kind of lifestyle, um, forsaking many uh, comforts and, uh, and, and often fasting so much that he endangered his health. Uh, on a few occasions. He took to a vigorous defense of the Nicene Creed. And remember, it's help, I think it's helpful to remember the framework we're talking about, the time period we're talking about here in history, the heresy of Arianism, right, uh, that Jesus is not the same being, essence, or substance as God the Father. Uh, in fact, according to Arianism, Jesus was a created being who had not always existed. There, I mean, therefore, there was a time when Jesus did not exist. He was not even co-eternal. Uh, forget talking about him as same essence or substance. That had only recently been denounced as a heresy at the First Council of Nicaea in 325. And there was still a great deal of Arianism that was being taught in these decades between uh, the, the, the closure of the First Council of Nicaea and the end of the fourth century. The Emperor Theodosius adhered to the creed, but many other uh, prominent Roman nobles and aristocrats who were Christians, professed Christians, were still Arians, uh, even into the late fourth century. So this gives us, I think, a little bit of a snapshot into how gradual, uh, well, we think about it anyway, it was not a sudden event, how gradual was the universal acceptance of our creed uh, over that fourth century? It was not until 381 at the First Council of Constantinople that the creed was truly finalized uh, at, at that council, the Second Ecumenical Council. So in the meantime, there are these rather high-ranking Arians uh, who demanded the use of churches in Milan, and Ambrose refused them. So here again, you know, like, how to win friends and influence people, right? He, he refused them outright, publicly, saying, quote, if you demand in person, I am ready to submit, carry me, no, if you demand my person, my person, I am ready to submit, carry me to prison or to death, I will not resist, but I will never betray the church of Christ. I will not call upon these people to save me, I will die at the foot of the altar rather than desert it. It's a public statement. So yes, we get this image of this very staunch and bold defender uh, of the faith. It's very much at the center of our historical understanding uh, of St. Ambrose, but there is so much more to him than just that. He was bold and strict, yes. We can take that away easily. But he was also flexible and tolerant when conditions permitted that. An interesting kind of juxtaposition when you think about it. For instance, he advised a charitable approach. Again, these are from public statements that he made. 
He advised a very charitable approach when it came to communicating with Arians. For instance, if you're communicating with them one-on-one, -on -one, be charitable, be kind. Um, the same is true for pagans. Be charitable, be kind. Believing, of course, that they could be one to the truth if not disparaged or insulted or treated harshly, that they could be one to the truth. This no doubt influenced a young man who was inspired to convert to Christianity because of having heard St. Ambrose. Uh, and I'm talking, of course, about St. Augustine of Hippo, who is a major source for us on the life, by the way, the life of, 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 of Ambrose. St. Augustine is the one who once said, quote, if you win an argument but lose a soul for Christ, then who did your argument serve? Right? I, again, I think that's a message we can all sort of take away, isn't it? That, that in our rhetoric, when we have discourse with people, how do we speak to them? Right? How do we speak to them? St. Ambrose is known for his, uh, for his flexibility in other areas as well. And these are just, these are just ways that probably... Uh, Always, I think, that nurtured the faith in, in this. He's probably what were very tumultuous times uh, in the fourth century. I think it's difficult for us to have the perspective of living in an age when there was that much uh, ongoing discussion about the person and nature of Jesus Christ. That there was that much kind of fluidity to the, to the, the theological debates that were going on. Uh, and with the looming collapse, to say nothing of the looming collapse of the Roman Empire all around them, in the secular sense, that's also going on by the end of the 4th and into the 5th century. As you'll see a little more when we talk about St. Augustine, that he definitely is living with the awareness that the empire is passing away and decaying, declining. So he is noted for flexibility in liturgy, which he first saw foremost, I think, saw as a way, uh, obviously a way that uniquely for local, regional churches to worship God, Le believing in leaving flexibility for them to have some cultural adaptations to the liturgy. Uh, not a rigid form, in other words, it could not be changed for local variations uh, that might speak to the culture of those people. And I'm not, I'm not speaking in any way of the essentials of the liturgy, the essentials uh, of, the, of the faith, but those things that are non-essential variations, right? The later Greek word that you're going to hear a lot by the time of the Protestant movement is adiaphora, those things that are not necessary, not essential, uh, do they really have an impact if, if you make some cultural local adaptations uh, to the liturgy? For instance, what he said to St. Augustine on this issue has an interesting history into our English language. Listen, listen to how St. Augustine quotes him. And he's quoting Ambrose. He says, when I am in Rome, I fast on a Saturday. When I am in Milan, I do not. Follow the custom of the church where you are. Do not be drawn into conflict over which church has the right for if there is no essential problem there. Okay? So do you remember how I told you, I think, the very first week that there were, I believe there are, uh, one of the reasons why the, the fathers and doctors, their writings are so compelling, uh, the things that they have spoken to influence the, uh, the, the faith through the centuries, uh, the reason I think that they are so important is because they're timeless. I mean, have I said anything that couldn't be applicable today? We think about conditions within the church, our civil discourse with each other, um, which right is right, right? Uh, and, he, and he speaks to that. If there's no essential problem there, even in the secular sense, this interpretation of what he said to St. Augustine has come down to us in English as, quote, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> that is the origin of that expression, by the way. So, speaking of... Um, Speaking of St. Augustine, and we will be taking a great deal, uh, a much larger look at him, obviously, in a couple of weeks when our series turns to look at him <coughs> specifically. Okay. But it was, of course, St. Ambrose who, as God used him to do such, I think is the best way to say that, who's primarily responsible for Augustine's conversion 
Uh, Augustine's life as a young man is a wild story, as you will learn. <laughs> it's a wild story of loose living, for sure, but an ongoing, sincere quest for truth. He had heart, he had heart for truth. <clears throat> it is a desire that led him to follow various philosophers, of course, as you're going to hear about, only to later become disillusioned with what they taught because it didn't ever feel like it was the truth. Augustine was teaching in Milan's great, powerful intellect. As a young man, his intellectual gifts were very obvious to anyone who knew him. And he had a teaching position in Milan. And um, this is how he came to hear the preaching of St. Ambrose, the bishop of Milan. And this is interesting, because since Augustine taught rhetoric, you see, he was always interested, when he would hear that someone was a good speaker, he was always interested in going to hear them. Not because he expected to be moved, particularly to, to change his life because of what they might have to say, but because he was interested in the skill of rhetoric. He was interested in studying public speaking. So, of course, he didn't just hear Ambrose speak. He heard Ambrose preach. During the final hours of the night, um, some reports place it at dawn, Easter Vigil, Easter morning, uh, April 24th and 25th of 387. Augustine was baptized by St. Ambrose in the Cathedral of Milan together with his son, Adiotitus, and along with, a, I think, a group of several others as well. But, but this, of course, um, this is a very popular depiction of that uh, 17th century, like 17th century depiction of the baptism of St. Augustine, but uh, I'm going to show you in a minute the place where it actually took place. It looked nothing like this, uh, but um, it is a, it's a beautiful depiction of it, nevertheless, because it brought to, to, to a happy end the long journey of Augustine's conversion. Uh, and, of course, he is the single most important, if you had to name one person, really, uh, of, the, of the last, well, the first millennium of Christianity. You, you cannot, you can't even have a conversation about any core Christian doctrine today without invoking Augustine, even if you don't know who he is. Mm -hmm. If you hear people discussing any core Christian teaching or doctrine, you are without a doubt invoking in some way the writings or influence of St. Augustine. So you'll hear a lot more about that. I don't want to take anything away from him. He's got his own day in two weeks. But <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and give you a glimpse of this now because below the cathedral in Milan, today, they have excavated the baptismal pool where this took place. Uh, it's a marvelous and quite moving archaeological accomplishment. It literally is below the floor of the, of the cathedral uh, in Milan today. And this is the baptismal pool. You can still see, you can see portions of the mosaic floor uh, that's still there. Uh, some, comments, uh, some commentators and historians have said that, um, that it was the solid, Christologically correct, Nicene theology of St. Ambrose that opened the eyes of Augustine uh, and obviously countless others. But as I think you're going to see, we cannot really separate the theology of St. Ambrose from his bold and decisive action. They, they actually go hand in hand. He was both a man of thought and a man of deed. Right? A man of thought and a man of deed. The word and the deed go hand in hand. You've heard that expression? The word and the deed go hand in hand. It's how you really um, sort of measure uh, measure a person. Do they walk the walk or just talk the talk? Mm -hmm. And St. Ambrose was a man of living faith. Uh, he walked the walk in every aspect of his life. I think most of his biographers absolutely concur. So I want to look to his writings. Uh, because we have one that we are reading this week, or some of you have already read. Remember that one of the requirements to be, to be called, to be named as a doctor of the church, uh, one of the requirements for that title is, to, is, is uh, for that to be bestowed on a person, is that they have made, to use this expression again, this is the church's expression, not mine, so I keep repeating it, significant intellectual contributions to the faith through their writings, they must have left behind a corpus of writing, something in writing. St. Ambrose left a lot 
many things. Uh, many, uh, many of his writings are in the forms of letters or homilies, hymns. He wrote some hymns as well. But most important are the five beautifully profound theological treatises that you see here, which are rich and deep in the way they resonate uh, uh, with the reader. Among these, for instance, is something called the Five Books of the Faith, or On the Faith, uh, which defends Nicene Christianity over the Arian viewpoint. The Three Books of the Holy Spirit are also called On the Holy Spirit. In that particular treatise, St. Ambrose shows that the Holy Spirit is the same as God, and of the same one nature and substance with the Father and the Son. And remember, this is that era of those great Christological conversations. And so, so he writes a treatise about it. He makes use of the Greek writers, um, St. Basil the Great and St. Athanasius, when he makes this argument. So you, I think you'll find that that, that sort of dovetails um, into a later uh, conversation we'll have, particularly about St. Basil the Great. Then there's the mystery of the Lord's incarnation, which argues how Jesus is perfect God and perfect man. And it's probably a, was intended to be a supplement to the first two there. Uh, it upholds, again, that Nicene position uh, that Jesus Christ is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial. That's that key language. Consubstantiality with the Father is that, that key Nicene term. The reader gets great insight uh, into the fervor and enthusiasm with which St. Ambrose must have spoken. I mean, just by reading his words, you, you, can, you can pick up on the fervor, the enthusiasm he had for refuting this Arian heresy. He wrote two books on penitence uh, that are in, in one volume, actually. He's writing uh, that work against Novatianism. Okay? Novatianism. I should give y'all like a whole quiz at the end on heresies, right? Because we've talked about that many of them. But, but, but to just talk very briefly uh, about that heresy. Uh, Novation is living in the, living actually in the early 3rd century. So, 200s, okay. Um, about 200 to 250-ish is about the era of Novation. He was a theologian who was arguing, because it was a time of intense persecution, he was arguing that Christians who had left the faith or who had uh, denounced their faith, renounced it, and in, in in, in seeking to avoid persecution, uh, to avoid uh, martyrdom, um, who might have burned incense on a pagan altar or taken an oath supporting the imperial gods, but that these people, the last, um, could not under any circumstances be readmitted to the church. They could never be readmitted to the faith, uh, according to, to, to Novation anyway. So, Following the martyrdom, and again, as I said, this is a, um, a, a period of persecution at the beginning of the 3rd uh, century. Uh, following the martyrdom of Pope St. Fabian, uh, circa 250, about the year 250, uh, there's, of course, a new, a new pope. Uh, we know it as Pope St. Cornelius, but it's Pope Cornelius. And Novation opposed him openly, publicly, by saying that Cornelius was far too lenient on the lapsed for allowing them to return to the church. So Novation, you had a good bit of support among some of the clergy in Rome, became essentially what, what is an anti-pope. They proclaimed him pope. And he began saying that he was the true pope, being elected with this, uh, chosen by this group of like-minded core dissidents who who could not see the, the, the mercy to permit someone to come back to the church. And this was eventually resolved uh, in a synod that was held in Rome, a large synod, um, that excommunicated Novation, obviously recognizing Cornelius as the true pope. St. Cyprian of Carthage, uh, who was a contemporary in his correspondence, speaks a lot about this. He tells us all about the whole drama 
uh, and the issue spilled over into the Council of Carthage that was held in 251. So even the records of that council speak to the drama of these, of these two popes, the anti-pope and the pope. And there's no question that the election of Cornelius was the valid one, that the selection of him was the valid one. And uh, so these were literally, there's really two separate issues going on here, and that's what I think could speak to us today. There's two separate issues. Because Novatianists, including Novation himself, did not submit to the Bishop of Rome or recognize his authority, he sort of sowed the seeds of discontent and dissidence among others, disaffected, who were self-righteous in their position that um, they had not yielded to imperial pressure, right? They would gladly die for their faith. So because they, because they actually don't recognize the authority of Pope Cornelius, Technically, the group are schismatics. They're schismatics because novation brings about a splinter. Uh, in the, remember, we've talked a lot about this before, the unity of the church being so crucial to the body of Christ. And novation brings about a splintering of that. So novation and his followers might be called, a fancy term would be sete vacantis, right? Sete vacantis. They believe the seat, the seat of St. Peter the see and the seat of St. Peter, were vacant. That Cornelius was not the real pope, so they didn't have to obey him. Okay? So, his merciful attitude of forgiveness was just far too liberal for novation and these people. So yes, the first issue is that novationism was a schismatic sect. The heresy is their denial of the church's ability to extend absolution and forgiveness even for the worst sinner. That's the heresy, you see. Mm -hmm. Still, novationism was alive and well into the fourth century, and as a matter of fact, it's indicated uh, by the fact that St. Ambrose and others are still dealing with it in copious, copious writings. They're still defending it, uh, defending the, the position of the church to admit lapsed, uh, the lapsed back into the church. By the time that St. Ambrose is writing, there's also a new heresy um, known as Donatism, which is essentially the same thing, uh, a new iteration of the same thing, that Christians who lapsed could never be readmitted. Uh, those are basically the same thing. St. Ambrose wrote those two books in about the year 384 against the Novatians and those of similar ilk. So if you think about it, if he's writing in the year 384, and, um, and Novation lived 200 to 250-ish, we're a long way in the future to still be dealing with something like that. But in the first book, uh, he sets out to prove that the power of forgiving, of forgiving sins was left by Christ to his church. In the second part, he affirms the necessity of going to confession and penance, uh, making it questionable for those uh, of the Protestant era. As a matter of fact, you don't really see a lot of, um, of questioning of any of these works until the post-Protestant era because this, this theological message is going to be challenged by, by Protestants and into, into modernity, of course. Then there is the work that appears in your reader, which is On the Mysteries. It's the one that I specifically selected uh, for its connection and continuity to the four great Latin doctors. It's, it's a work that, uh, that St. Ambrose compiled, essentially. Uh, it is it's a series of talks that he gave on, on baptism and the Eucharist and confirmation in the year 387 at the time of the conversion of St. Augustine. And, and think about it this way. It's, it's the talks that he gave, gave excuse me, to, to catechumens, uh, perhaps during Holy Week, uh, and to the newly baptized, to the neophytes, uh, talking about the, the mysteries uh, of the sacraments. And it's explaining, of course, all the theology and the ritual behind those sacraments. So he, he goes, for instance, explains first the rite of baptism. Those of you that have read this already know this. Uh, and the mysteries underlying these outward things, right? That, that a sacrament is an outward sign of an inner grace. He also addresses confirmation, uh, referring to the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, he writes of the Eucharist, putting forth the doctrine of the real presence, uh, that Christ being fully and mysteriously present in the elements 
uh, at the Eucharist. This work is very similar, I might add, to, uh, to a work by St. Cyril of Jerusalem from about the year 350. St. Cyril, as bishop there, imagine being a catechumen in Jerusalem with St. Cyril, and where he would literally, through the Holy Week, walk you to all these sites. Can you imagine? And hearing him speak about the mysteries uh, of, these, uh, of these sacraments, these catechetical lectures. This is pretty much the same thing that Ambrose has compiled uh, in On the Mysteries. So I hope that, that you will enjoy that. I mean, it's, it is a timeless, timeless piece, and, and again, very readable, I think. Okay, and then, of course, there is um, the, um, what I want to leave you with on that is the necessity of the, of the sacraments to salvation. I think the, the big takeaway core message as he, as he lays out both the theology behind baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist, the theology behind, excuse me, the, the ritual behind uh, behind them. Uh, the, the core takeaway there is the necessity of them. So what you're going to read, hopefully, is going to give you a glimpse of his keen intellect and, and logic. Nothing is really lost in translation, I think, between the Latin um, and the English as he speaks to those who are about to receive or who have just received the Easter's initiation sacraments. Might it be that those are the words that St. Augustine heard as a neophyte? Something, it's something fun to contemplate. And it's, it's, as I said, it's the reason any one of these would have made for, for wonderful, fantastic reading. And it's always, of course, I don't, you don't have to limit yourself to just reading on the mysteries. All of these are available in full text format in English translations online. Uh, there are excellent sources out there for that. The um, new advent, actually, which is the, the Catholic Encyclopedia Group, publishes these in an English translation uh, that you can access very easily. I don't limit yourself. If, if you find this, this interesting, I encourage you. Go read, go read some of the others as well. They really are quite timeless. Now, St. Ambrose... Um, died in the year 397, and his remains are in the church of St. Ambrose in Milan today, where they can be viewed, uh, still in his Episcopal vestments, okay, in a glass case. Um, the great Latin doctors, of which St. Ambrose is the first that we have looked at, are so called, if you haven't guessed this, are so called because they wrote in Latin. Exploring the great mysteries, the great doctrines of our Catholic faith. Um, when we turn to look at the Greek doctors, they are obviously doing the same thing, only in the Greek language. So, so what you're going to find is a, is a good deal of parallel between, for instance, the writings of St. Ambrose, uh, St. Augustine, and St. Basil the Great, uh, St. Gregory Nazianzus, for instance. There's parallel because they're, they're, contemporary, they're contemporaries. And they're dealing with the same issues in the church. So, so the perspective difference is language only. It's not that one professes uh, a more correct or true version uh, of creedal Christianity. It points, I think, to a universality that transcends the language divide of late antiquity with the eastern portion of the empire, uh, primarily Greek, the western portion primarily Latin, uh, transcends that divide. The truth is the same in any language. The same in any language. So we're going to be uh, picking up more next week with the life of my favorite personality of the period, St. Jerome. You've heard me quote him a lot uh, in here. He was, he was um, very gifted, obviously, with languages, but he was also quite the historian. Uh, he's the one who compiled all of those illustrious men called it, the, the, all those, uh, the recounting of the lives of the, of the early church. And uh, so the reading for that, which is in your reader, deals with um, kind of a funny story I think you'll enjoy involving a priest named Vigilantius, and you can't make that up, <laughs> Vigilantius, uh, which uh, is interesting because of something we touched upon last week, the, uh, the veneration of relics. You remember I sort of mentioned this little anecdote gave you a heads up that that was coming because uh, St. Jerome vigorously defends uh, the veneration of relics in this letter. So we'll set the stage for that next week.
But anyway, so that's today. That's a wrap for St. Ambrose, and please join us next week for St. Jerome. Thank you, guys. Thank you.